John Major came into number 10 as Prime Minister in November 1990, and arguably the most traumatic circumstances of any modern Prime Minister, with the possible exception of Theresa May, who, of course, became Prime Minister after the drama of the Brexit referendum. He became Prime Minister after the act of regicide by the Parliamentary Party, the removal of Margaret Thatcher, an event that many MPs who I can recall speaking to at the time could hardly believe they had carried out, the removal of a three times election winner against her will. Um, and he moved in as someone who, although very ambitious and had wanted the leadership, hadn't expected it at that time. Of course he hadn't. No one knew that the act of regicide was going to happen. Um, he had been both Chancellor and Foreign Secretary, but only very briefly. So he wasn't as experienced as some of the other potential candidates for leadership. And he faced a formidable intrigue. The Conservative Party had been miles behind in the opinion polls, which is, of course, one of the reasons why they removed Margaret Thatcher. They had introduced this flagship policy, the poll tax, which had proven to be so unpopular that even Conservatives in Kent were known to be out demonstrating against it. And he faced a negotiation with the rest of the European Union over the forthcoming Maastricht Treaty, which many of his MPs were shifting nervily as they contemplated the moves towards that treaty, including his predecessor, Margaret Thatcher. It was tough. And yet here, in a way, is the first twist of Major's leadership. In a way that has been largely overlooked, I think, his period of leadership between November 1990, when he became Prime Minister, and the election in April 1992 was a triumph. Um, against many odds, Major won that election. It was the fourth successive victory of the Conservatives, and he secured, in terms of the percentage of the vote, more than Margaret Thatcher in her three election victories. It was the highest percentage vote of any of the wins. And he did it by giving the impression almost that there had been a change of government when he took over um, without a general election. His style was so different from what had gone before and to some extent so was the policy focus. Uh, it was almost as if the Conservative Party under him in his early phase had moved from being a party of Thatcherite crusading zeal to one closer to, say, the Christian Democrats in Germany. And he pulled off this trick, if it is a trick, it was partly substance too, in a number of ways. Partly his own personality, almost to the point of naivety, was so different from hers. He was not at all grand or lofty at the beginning. Uh, indeed, a colleague of mine, I was at the BBC when John Major became Prime Minister, a political correspondent, and one of my colleagues, not the political editor, but a junior figure, happened to have John Major's mobile and phoned it several weeks after John Major had been Prime Minister one weekend. And Major answered and carried on talking to this guy um, as if he was a junior minister starting out in his career. He was actually then Prime Minister in Chequers. There was a kind of innocence early on. He loved nothing more than stopping off at a motorway cafe to have a coffee and a fried breakfast. And although this was to some extent contrived, as every public move is when you're a Prime Minister, there was an authenticity to it as well. He felt very different. And he did something quite smart very early on. In his first Prime Minister's questions as Prime Minister, the extraordinary drama that had preceded this Prime Minister's questions, he made two important interventions. The first, a Conservative MP, asked a critical question of the BBC 
assuming Major would approve of his onslaught on the BBC. Major chose quite deliberately to praise the BBC and to, I mean, he changed his mind quite often about the BBC in the years to come, but he started off by distancing himself from the onslaughts that had become pretty intense then from Conservative backbenchers. He also announced in his first Prime Minister's question some more money for a part of the health service to symbolise a recognition that public services had declined in recent years under his predecessor. And he made a series of important appointments, the key one being appointing Chris Patton to become chairman of the Conservative Party. It was the combination of Major and Patton together that made it look as if, it, as if there had almost been a change of government. Patton was a pro-European. His politics were very different from Margaret Thatcher's. And as the two of them set about their course with an evident rapport, his predecessor, who had been excited by the choice of John Major, Margaret Thatcher had wanted Major to take over, became increasingly alarmed. But on one level, her alarm was a tribute to the way Major was adapting his party to the demands of the time. And as he moved towards the 1992 election, he dealt skillfully with the two seemingly impossible obstacles. The first was the poll tax. During the leadership contest, he was smart enough not to be entirely clear what he was going to do with this tax. He knew that Margaret Thatcher and others supported him and it. He said there would be a review. Other candidates, like Michael Heseltine in that contest, pledged to abolish it. But the moment he got into number 10, he knew exactly what he had to do. To win an election, he had to abolish what Margaret Thatcher regarded as her flagship. And he gave the task to Michael Heseltine, the figure who had wielded the knife, so to speak, against Margaret Thatcher in the early stages of the leadership contest. It was a smart move. Heseltine had been against the poll tax from the beginning, had opposed it passionately when he was on the back benches and had voted against it. And he then had the challenge of coming up with an alternative, a challenge which proved to be quite traumatic. They took a long time over it. And in the end, Castletine came up with the council tax, which was pretty similar to the property tax, the rates that had been in place before Margaret Thatcher had introduced her poll tax. But they got there, and Michael Heseltine was responsible for selling the policy to the party, which he did rather well. So they removed one of the great vote-losing policies that Labour had hoped would propel them to power in an election. The next challenge was Europe, the eternal challenge for Conservative Prime Ministers. The Maastricht Treaty negotiations were looming. And in that treaty, there were two things that Conservative MPs, or a lot of them, found unacceptable. The single currency, signing up to that, and the social chapter. And so how was Major going to square the circle? of signing up to a treaty. You couldn't just walk away from a treaty, you'd be walking away from the European Union, which wasn't on the agenda then. Major went to that negotiation and performed with considerable skill. It shows what happens when a Prime Minister is confident with his parliamentary party. And obviously at that point, Major had grounds to be very confident. It was only the Conservative MPs who voted in the leadership contest that gave him that victory. And he used that authority to sign the Maastricht Treaty, but he got two vital opt-outs, which incidentally shows it's a myth that the European Union is utterly indifferent to British demands and are inflexible. Major got an opt-out on the Euro, and he got an opt-out on the social chapter. He declared very prematurely, as it turned out, um, at the end of that summit, game, set and match to the UK. It turned out not to be. His life became hellish in relation to this treaty. But in the build-up to the 1992 election, it was a brilliant piece of manoeuvring 
The opt-outs just about kept his parliamentary party happy, um, and yet he had signed up to the treaty. He gave a number of speeches co-written with Chris Patton, the pro-European party chairman, in which he talked about wanting Britain to be at the heart of the European Union, punctuated with much Euroscepticism. Uh, Major was not as pro-European as Chris Patton, but the tone was markedly different to Margaret Thatcher. He was wise enough to give some of these speeches in other parts of the European Union, not the UK, but that's a pattern of all British prime ministers when it comes to Europe. But it felt different. And he did one other thing in this period, the 1990 to 92 period, which was, it was much mocked, but actually was quite a clever idea, based actually on other European Union countries. He announced a citizen's charter in which citizens who used public services would be more empowered than they had been to demand better value. They would be able to get their money back if trains failed to arrive within a certain time, etc. It became mocked partly because there was no practical impact. Public services were on their knees. He wasn't inclined to, or arguably in a position to greatly increase public spending, and so they continued to be on their knees. And that's what voters on the whole noticed. But the symbolic focus on recognising that public services were not good and the users of them felt pretty powerless was another important act in the rehabilitation, this very quick rehabilitation of the Conservative Party that took place in this period. Indeed, it is arguable that the major pattern Tory party between November 1990 and the election in 1992 was an act of modernisation, to use that overused, vague, evasive but ubiquitous term, more so than the Cameron and Osborne leadership, because Major, in terms of substance, addressed Europe, the relationship between government and users of public services, and transformed the relationship between government and local taxation by scrapping the poll tax. If modernisation means moving on from your immediate past, there is at least a case that Major was the moderniser of that period. And he won. Uh, extraordinarily, in 1992, the economy was gloomy. Some people thought he won because of that great cliché that people hold on to nurse for fear of something worse. But I don't think it was just that. I think it was the combination of changes that had been brought about subtly in the period after November 1990. But Major's leadership, more than any other Prime Minister, is one of two halves. I think if that period is underestimated, the success he had in winning that fourth election, the hell that followed is almost underestimated too. It's like a great theatrical drama of two utterly different acts. Interestingly, two things happened almost right away. One is, I think, Major misread partly the success of his victory. He thought during his 92 campaign, which was another odd election campaign in many ways, was partly down to his own personal performance. He went out on a soapbox with a megaphone, uh, shouting at people in Luton and places. And he thought that kind of folksy form of campaigning was highly successful, made him seem in direct connection with the voters. If you look at the footage, to be brutal, it looks absurd. That's not why he won. Um, but he thought he was one of the reasons, and he kept on trying to repeat it during the traumatic phase of his leadership, and it really did then look absurd because you're looking at him through a different prism. The other thing is, is something he did recognise. He said to Chris Patton, who incidentally lost his seat in that election, one of the big problems for Major right at the beginning. Major was an insecure figure in many ways and was dependent on people he liked and could trust. And when Patton lost, he lost a key 
ally. And he said to Patton on the Friday after the election, we've pushed what should happen in electoral politics beyond its normal boundaries. And it will be almost impossible to do so again. So he had a kind of foreboding of doom on the day of his triumph. It is now widely thought that the doom began with the trauma of Britain leaving the exchange rate mechanism in September, just a few months after the election. In my view, something happened before then that made sure Major's life was going to be a nightmare. And it was this. In May, before anything to do with the exchange rate mechanism had happened, just a few weeks after his election victory, Denmark, in a referendum, voted against the Maastricht Treaty. Now, at this point, although Major had come back game, set and match on Maastricht, there had been no parliamentary legislation. That was still to come. And when the Danes voted against, it emboldened those Tory MPs who loathed the European Union and everything to do with Maastricht, irrespective of the opt-outs. I know this very well. Just by coincidence, a colleague and I had booked to have a lunch with John Redwood, one of his Eurosceptic ministers. It happened to be the day after the Danish referendum, and it was in a restaurant in a basement. And Redwood, who was not instinctively exuberant as a figure, is still not instinctively exuberant, leapt down the stairs joyously and just sat at the table and said yes to Denmark. And that wasn't the government position. The government position was still to support the Maastricht Treaty. I think it was that referendum that emboldened Tory MPs to decide to wreck the Maastricht Treaty when Major took it to Parliament. And then, when Britain fell out of the exchange rate mechanism, it emboldened them further because, inevitably, Major became a weaker figure. One of the lessons of leadership is that leaders do not recover from a humiliating devaluation of the currency. Harold Wilson never recovered from the devaluation in 1967, and in a way this was more vividly dramatic as, during the day, as we headed towards the exit, Major put up interest rates again and again and again until they reached ridiculous levels in an attempt to stay in the exchange rate mechanism and then had to give up. And from that day until the 1997 election, he was never ahead in the opinion polls again, having just won a decisive election victory in terms of percentage of vote, but crucially not in terms of seats. He had a small overall majority. At that point, as often happens in politics, when one thing goes wrong, it all becomes conflated. He lost totally disconnected with any of this. Another close ally, David Meller, who was forced to resign because of some sex scandal at the time. He tried desperately to keep hold of him, but in the end had to give in and he lost Meller. Um, other things started to go wrong and the media decided almost collectively that this was a weak prime minister behaving weakly. And at that point, Conservative MPs became even more emboldened to go for him. It is fascinating the chemistry of politics. When weakness is perceived, a prime minister becomes weaker still. And Major struggled from the beginning to get the Maastricht Treaty through Parliament. He had to pull every lever. In a way, it was an early sign of what ended up with that Brexit referendum. The Conservative Party had become unleadable on Europe. The earliest sign, actually, was fascinating. The Conservative Party conference in 1992, held a few weeks after Britain had fallen out of the exchange rate mechanism, was an event of historic significance. Conservative Party conferences had been on the whole loyal rallies in which party activists attended to pay homage to the cabinet and the prime minister or their leader. This one felt like the Labour Party gatherings of the 1980s. Speakers who attacked Major and his government, like Norman Tebbit, were cheered to the rafters 
Fringe meetings were full of intense clashes. And in a way, the Conservative Party has never been the same since, for good or for bad. Even now, their party conferences have more ideological verve than, say, Labour's did uh, when they were heavily controlled by Blair, Brown and, indeed, Miliband. Um, and after that, in Parliament, Major could not control his MPs, who voted again and again against Maastricht. He had to hold a vote of confidence, and if he had lost that, he would have had to have called a general election. At one point, he referred, not knowing the tape was on, to the bastards in his cabinet, who he couldn't control. It was all over Europe. It wasn't a personal thing. In New Labour, there were quite a lot of personal tensions. Here, Major's cabinet were all, or a lot of them, were old friends from Cambridge University. But they fell out over Europe. And in the end, again, in perhaps an early sign of what was to happen with Cameron and Europe, Major did the most extraordinary thing. He announced that he was resigning. He was still Prime Minister. This was July 1995. He announced he was resigning as leader of the Conservative Party to hold a contest almost against himself um, in order to get MPs to back him. Uh, it was still an election then, just of MPs. So we had, and in a way, even looking back now, how extraordinary. We always say how extraordinary politics is post-Brexit. Think of this. There he was, he was still Prime Minister, but he was holding a leadership contest to get re-elected as Conservative leader. And to his surprise, he wasn't expecting it, John Redwood, the one who was excited after the Danish referendum results, stood against him. He didn't win, but Major didn't win by a sort of hugely commanding majority. But it was enough to give him the space to carry on. But he carried on without having any blissful moments again. Even when he tried to move away from Europe and try and get a focus on his domestic policies. He tried to kind of do it under an umbrella theme called Back to Basics. He announced a Back to Basics policy at one of the party conferences. And what he meant by that was let's get Back to Basics, focus on education, focus on crime, focus on the basics, rather than rowing about Europe. But one of his spin doctors said in a briefing it was also an attack on the permissive society, which meant all hell broke loose because any Conservative MP, not in a conventional marriage or having an affair, were in danger of looking like total hypocrites. And there was one front page story after another of such affairs. And Major, again, instead of escaping from the hell of Europe, found that when he tried to move away, matters got darker still. Even during the 97 election campaign, where he faced Tony Blair at his most formidable, Major was still pleading with his party. Um, he said at one point at one of the election press conferences, please don't bind my hands before I go to Amsterdam for the next EU treaty. An extraordinary message from a Prime Minister supposedly dressing a wider electorate. By then he was doomed, partly because Tony Blair at that point walked on water in the eyes of the electorate and much of the media, but also because of all that had preceded uh, in that five-year period. The Tory party had become unelectable. But he too struggled, um, although I think he was impressive between 1990 and 1992, he wasn't equipped for the incredible stress of this period. Arguably no one would have been, but he certainly wasn't. He got very sensitive, understandably, about the newspaper coverage. Uh, Douglas Hurd has reported subsequently that he used to try and hide the newspapers from John Major. Uh, he wanted to get the first editions the night before and then he wouldn't sleep with fury. They had to hide the evening standard when that came in late afternoon. He got too worked up and his press secretary at the time revealed he used to get phone calls from John Major on Boxing Day saying, have you seen page eight of the Daily Express, a page that few voters will have read on Boxing Day. He also unfairly got caught up in 
something that I think the media are much more culpable for, uh, for than politicians. And that was his whole government was seen through the prism of sleaze, a word that erupted around this time. There is no doubt that some of the politicians in his party were sleazy. One ended up in jail, Jonathan Aitken. But Major himself, for his faults and his flaws, was not. He was a decent figure, trying his best in very difficult circumstances. But when the opinion polls at the time were published, sleaze was one of the issues that most concerned voters about his leadership. It's one of the lessons of leadership that when things go wrong, people see you in an entirely different light and there's nothing you can do about it. So someone who was not corrupt or in it for himself was perceived in such a light because everything else was going wrong. One of the ironies is that in that 97 election campaign, when he was slaughtered and his party was slaughtered, um, some of his messages might have been pretty prophetic. He campaigned against Labour's devolution plans and on the last day he was Prime Minister, the last day of that election campaign, he flew to different parts of the UK warning that devolution could lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom. At the time it seemed rather pathetic and outdated and part of his kind of 1950s traditionalism. Labour's devolution plan seemed sensible, modest and with the times. But in retrospect, the case can be made at least that he was absolutely spot on. That devolution, instead of ending the momentum towards nationalism, hastened it and has led to what has happened today where there's another demand for a referendum on independence in Scotland. But the messages weren't heard. He was doomed and he knew he was doomed. And when he lost on the Friday after the election, he went to Lords to watch some cricket. He looked relieved and has looked relieved ever since. Much calmer, much more relaxed and indeed authoritative when he gives interviews. The only Prime Minister to be forced out of number 10 to have looked relieved as the removal took place, which perhaps suggests that for all his successes, certainly early on, maybe he was the wrong person for that particular job at that particular time. But always make judgments of prime ministers by looking at the context. And it would, because of Europe, have challenged the most titanic of prime ministers. And John Major would not have claimed, I think, to be a titanic prime minister.